<clears throat> Excuse me. Hello, everybody. We're continuing on uh, in Genesis chapter 3, where uh, after explaining the two stories of origin, these creation stories that give you the idea that man was created in the image of God, and he was, as the image bearer, he was given dominion over the creation. And the creation itself is the uh, a model type of a, uh, a temple. And that as the image bearer, he represents deity and and that's how he's able to exercise the, the uh, dominion over the creation. And this was given to him, that he was given dominion over the earthly realm, and uh, but had access to the heavenly realm, which is these other transcendent uh, dimensions. And at that point there, he's in contact with this realm, him and his wife, and they have access to that invisible realm and can see all these other creatures. And so this is what's going on. You're seeing this, this situation where it starts in Genesis 3, where the serpent was more crafty than other other beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. And um, there's a lot of echoes there because, you know, he, he uses the word uh, uh, beast. You know, what, what's the um, the title of the Hasatanic uh, uh, imposter messiah, the beast power? The, these parodies and the, this language follows through where, you know, because this this serpent is it, it actually in the Hebrew, it's actually a triple entendre. It's not just a double entendre. It's a triple entendre. But the point is, you know, it's it's uh, it's the word Nakash. And, uh, you know, it, it can be treated serpent, but also can be treated as one who speaks omens or or uh, soothsayer or ultimately it's recognized as the shining one. So just like Adam and Eve are luminescent, had glory, that's why they weren't surprised, you know, and even um, this Nakash, again, that's another shorthand name for one of these uh, creatures that are in that realm, and he's not the only one that has that likeness and shape, it's just that he's dealt with in, individually in particular, and he's described as being uh, more crafty, you know, and again, this is where, um, why do you have craftiness? Well, because you're thinking for yourself and you have pride. So this is this is where evil and sin come from. It, it wasn't Adam and Eve themselves that were responsible for sin. And that's why the Bible doesn't really explain um, where evil comes from. It does in, in sort of on a, a tangent or, or some of the other uh, Second Temple Judaism stuff. There's all these other materials that explain, you know, some more of this stuff. And, and uh Again, Israel had access to all the stuff that was in their temple library, but us being Gentiles and way removed from that past and in the future, we had no access to this stuff. And it's only recent days that some of this material has been made uh, accessible through these ancient writings being translated to English. And, you know, it just fills in a lot of blanks that just weren't there that these other people had. And again, it was common knowledge where, you know, just like we tell the story about 9-11 or World War II, like these are all within living memory. Some of us were alive when these things happened, so you you still have a context, even though you're 50, 60, 80 years into the future. Well, you know, even for these guys, because they live such long lives, all this stuff is, you know, this knowledge is contemporaneously. It wasn't really till after the flood that um, this stuff and and uh, the Tower of Babel, where the languages were shifted and different nations were given different languages, so that a lot of this knowledge. It gets lost in translation or just gets lost in, in the storytelling. So you you have a situation here where it's not strange for for them to actually recognize that this other creature is talking to them. You know, and and uh this Nakash actually uh, he's he's more like a seraphim where he's actually this whole idea of the reptile. That's where this idea of these uh reptile beings come from, that these reptile beings are, are a form of Elohim that is an interdimensional being that is both good and bad. You know, it all depends on whether they're loyalty to the most high Elohim, Yahweh, or whether they're rebelled and, and um, are part of the fallen group that of these Elohim creatures that are looking to subvert uh, the creation at, on our level and try and destroy it and uh, somehow subvert God's plan. But it, that's not actually how it works. But all this stuff happens because Everyone's allowed to use their freedom, and even because of the interdimensional interconnection, this creature was allowed to do what it did, and as we go through the rest of the next uh, 
from three to 11, you know, explain some of the other background with her. There's been more than one Elohim incursion or what they call angelic incursion or fallen angels. Or This is where all these stories come from. And a lot of this knowledge was embedded, you know, in ancient Greek and Roman culture with their pantheon of deities and stuff like that, or the Sumerians, the Egyptians and the Babylonians or the Assyrians. And a lot of this stuff has just been covered up or just hasn't been made clear to quote unquote modern man because, you know, we're, 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 <laughs> We're not as smart as we think we are, and we're ignorant of a lot of these things. And so our world is very small, and um, we live in the comfort of a modern box where we just pursue entertainment and have no concern for any things that are important, uh, namely this world, the next life, who God is, what's really going on, where did evil come from, you know, why is the world the way that it is, why is there something instead of nothing, asking big questions, you know, in our science so-called, you know, in many ways it's been infiltrated and, and – uh, it's not so much the pursuit of knowledge or, or pure truth. It's it's propaganda. And uh, anyone who tries to bring a different paradigm to think things through and think things together, you know, they get um, defunded or uh, ostracized or ridiculed or, you know, in any way, shape or form, they, they get marginalized and called conspiracy theories. You know, it just, you know, you, 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 it's hard to get away with killing people nowadays if they have an, a different voice. You don't have to kill people. You just have to brand them crazy or whatever like that and and all of a sudden people will run from them so they, they won't actually ever ask well what did they really believe and why and what was their proof you know and that's that's part of the challenge so we've got this story and and people don't realize this is the the critical story that tells you everything that's going on from the beginning to the end and uh part of the challenge is it's it's still the same challenge at this current time this current generation is pursuing Luciferianism or Satanism or whatever other kind of Moloch or Baal or Astarte or any other one of these fallen deities names, you know, and that the small G God is just their, their Elohim. They're just these supernatural creatures in that other dimension. But they're, they're again, they're creatures. They were made by the same creator God that made us. And they're, they're meant to be servants or, or of those who are heirs of salvation or heirs that are meant to rule over the heavenly realm and uh it's a two-step process you know on this plan that's been set in motion uh, it can't be stopped you know one because the creator has the source of all power and knows everything and so these creatures they can try and throw a roadblock into what's going on and this is the beginning of the roadblock where they're trying to tempt the woman to take from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil and somehow grasp for power grasp for uh you know because it you know, you don't realize the uh, the challenge that's put there. You know, if you do this, you'll be like God. Well, why why is he saying that? How, how could he even suggest that if there wasn't a kernel of truth that both her and Adam would have believed it? You know, in that word God, that's translated as Elohim, because that's the thing that like, Yahweh is the most high Elohim, and all these other Elohim were made as sons of God, sons of heaven, you know, or, or angels, as, as we would call them. And, and it's the same thing where... They are image bearers and part of the divine council and part of God's government and him ruling his creation. And the same thing with human beings. We create the image and likeness and are called the children of God or sons and daughters of God or the son of God. And uh, we're given this uh, representation here to exercise dominion over the earth. And so you have this situation where uh, there's a promise in Psalm 2, Psalm 8, and quoted again in Hebrews uh, 2, uh, you know, what is what is God that man's mind, or what is man that God's mindful of him that the Son of Man should care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels is what it says in the Greek, but in the Hebrew it says you made a little lower than the, angel, and the, the Elohim, but you got raised him in glory. Because th this two-step process is what these this fallen being didn't understand, and it's not made clear how this story is going to work itself out, but they were, God already knew that these creatures were going to rebel, and that they were going to they were prepared, a, a lake of fire was prepared for them. And this is where this whole idea of hell comes from. It's not necessarily and primarily primarily for human beings. You know, human beings are actually made so they can change, that they can get caught up like they did here with Adam and Eve and, and fall subject to the, the Hasatan and all those other minions that try and uh, create an eclipse of darkness to enslave humanity to not know who their creator and maker is or their savior. But you know, they, they don't have all power and, and they can't stop this. They can think they can try and delay it or postpone it or whatever like that. But everything is moving exactly according to schedule. And 
nothing uh, can disrupt the plan. And uh, but again, we're not necessarily all privy to this and, and not really clear on how it all is working itself out. But, you know, the, the temptation starts, you know, where this crafty one puts doubt where he's challenging them. At, well, you can eat from every tree, but what about this tree? You know, and so he and he, and he phrased it in such a way that uh, did God not tell you that you should not eat from the fruit of this tree in the midst of the garden? Uh, neither touch it lest you die you know and and uh then then the uh the, the woman you know is is trying to say well you know we we've heard this and even she didn't quote exactly back what she was told you know where she adds the aspect of of touch it you know but the, but the thing they realize the consequences die and like they don't even really understand what that means none of us really do because it hasn't really till you go through it, you don't really understand what it means because it's a point on demand to die once, then the judgment, but then there's this whole new reality that's been exposed to us that it's not the first death that that uh, is you, what you have to worry about. It's a second death because everyone's going to get a chance to respond to Jesus, each according to their uh, time frame, whether you're a firstborn child and, and, uh, and harvested in the church era or whether you're able to respond there at the last great day judgment where you'll be second born and because you didn't believe during the time you had, you're not going to get the same inheritance, you're not going to get the same reward, but you still will have a participation in the, the new creation in the other realm and, and have, uh, have, a, have a life there that isn't quite the same as the others. You know, this is where uh, the whole promise of the new covenant is described, well, that all shall know me from the least to the greatest. And so there's a least and there's a greatest. And there's a firstborn and there's a secondborn. And the firstborn tradition always gets a double portion of inheritance. And they're the ones who, Get to rule the, uh, the the generations and and the family, and so uh, you know it's in the backdrop of this material where we're we're um, seeing this temptation that goes on, and it was the woman who took from the tree, and and Adam was standing right there, which is really quite strange because he watched her do that, and um, he could see that uh, her her she was over being overcome, where she, you know she sees the tree good for food. Lust of the eyes, sorry to make one wise, pride of life, and then took the fruit and ate it, and, you know, the, the, the lust of the flesh, you know, and, and then she gave some to her husband, you know, and, and the way Paul puts that in, in the New Testament, he says, well, the woman was deceived, you know, and that's what she says, well, the, the serpent deceived me. So she was misled. And this is the critical component of the story. Where Adam saw what happened, and, and again, like I say this, you know, as a joke, but Adam was the first one to see a naked woman, you know, both both when the, God brought the man to her, but also after she fell, when she sinned and, and, and broke that commandment, she lost the translucence, she lost the glory, and so she was, you know, shown in the shape where she is now, where she doesn't have this translucence and this glory, and, and they lost the connection of their unity. Because of the sin that that intervened, their oneness was was uh, was broken, and so, you know, he had to make a choice: was he going to take the fruit with her when she gave it to eat or not? And Paul tells us that he transgressed; he willingly did this. And this is this is the, this is the greatest love story, where even though he was told that he was going to die if he took from that tree, just like his wife did, but he loved his wife so much and couldn't live without her that he willingly joined with her and her lot and what was going to happen to her and that and now as you see what happened their eyes were open and they realized that they were naked and uh this is the story where god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and there's this motif where he's the second adam and he's the bridegroom of this new bride that's being recreated and you have the story actually uh duplicating itself and it's being made manifest in such a way that it's talking about a permanent creation where God unions himself to humanity. And that's actually how we get eternal life. And, and we have access to the tree of life. And what's going to happen is this Nakash who deceived them, he's put under a curse because he deceived the woman and had the malevolence to try and destroy God's creation, you know, and, and uh, the key thing in this is Genesis 3.15 where uh, I'll put M between you and the woman, between her offspring and, and or your offspring and her offspring. And most translations translate that as seed, and seed is 
children or progeny. You don't think, well, how can the woman have progeny without being impregnated by the man? See, that in this alone tells you something something strange about the way this uh, story is being told. And the other aspect of the story there that, well, how is this Nakash? How is the serpent going to have its own seed? See, and that's the mystery of that's been hidden from the foundation of the world for the majority of people in our modern era, that they don't understand that this battle isn't just between human beings and good and evil or God and, and Satan or whatever like that. There are these other malevolent creatures that have been in the background and at the forefront, but we didn't know how to name them or classify them or, or understand their role in the way that we all have been deceived. You know, and this is this is one of the main understandings you have to understand. So even how is it a woman could have seed? Is this a precursor for God telling us that uh, her seed was going to be a supernatural child in the future from a woman named Mary, you know, who had a, a son that was both God and man, and he would be the mediator between God and man, and he'd be the one that would overcome the serpent, the temptation of the Hasatan and the evil ones. and because he never sinned, he didn't deserve the penalty of death. So when they killed him, he died like a man, not because he had to die. He died for all of us to draw us back into his new life, into fellowship with God, and to overcome the burden and the gulf that when he took on our nature, he totally overcame the ontological separation, right at the core of our being, so that every human being, going all the way back to Adam and Eve and to every future child, even these kids that have been aborted, they're not dead. You know, Satan thinks he can destroy God's creation, but he can't. God's already committed because he loves humanity so much and is committed to prepare us for the new age and be prepared for this new creation that it's for us to rule over, not for them. And uh, a lot of these creatures are still fulfilling what they're meant to do, worshiping God and seeing his glory and watching out the way he works out his wisdom here in this realm. But there's a whole bunch of other ones that are trying to sabotage and claim that they're the wise one and they know and they have the pride and the desire and, and the wherewithal to think that they actually could challenge God and overcome both him and his creation and, and destroy his people. Well, so this is the big point, you know, for us to understand. This is where it begins, you know. And, and then, so that, that, that lays the groundwork for the spiritual undoing. And then you have the problem between the husband and the wife where you know, he'll rule over her, and that's that's what happened, that the husband became the head of the wife, even though, she, you know, because she already demonstrated that, that she wasn't listening, and she was created second, not first, so she didn't have primary authority, but then because the man listened to the woman, you know, it's the same old story again, where uh, all the days of his life, he works real hard to provide, and uh, there's no guarantee that he's going to be able to provide for him or his household. But the the key point here is that it, it tells you that you'll return to dust because you were taken out of dust, and this is the first death. But embedded within us is the potentiality, a seed that allows us to uh, be able to transcend this realm and be part of a brand new creation that God has planned, where there's no evil, there's no death, and there's no sin. And uh, this is why the world's history continues the way that it does there's no losing in God's realm. He tolerates people's freedom because of contingency, but he has ultimate freedom. He's not restrained by anything because he's not controlled by time or restricted by time. He made time. And one of the mysteries about the way things work is that these creatures themselves are subject to time. You know, and so they, they can't travel in the future and, and they're reading the book just like we're reading the book, but they don't understand necessarily all the details. And that's where, the human being has direct communication with his God and Father and Maker through Jesus by the Spirit to be able to have access to gain and learn this stuff. And this is the whole point of being a Christian, to learn the mystery of why you are and what the purpose is. And, uh, you know, there's so much more going on than what we all realize that we can't even really begin to take in. But, you know, there there's a line being, a line being drawn in the sand where, you know, the final battle is being shaped up and... Um, I know we call, you know, the popular culture calls Armageddon or the apocalypse or whatever like that. But, you know, it's when you read the book in Revelation 19, it ends like in a matter of, uh, you know, seconds. You know, he just speaks the word and they're destroyed. And so, uh, you know, but the, but the problem is uh, up until that point, 
you know, there, there's the, there's a loosening and, uh, and the restrainer is being um, uh, uh, loosened in such a way so that the Holy Spirit isn't protecting the culture and the world anymore. And all this evil is going to start manifesting itself in far greater ways, like whether it's alien disclosure, which is, you know, fallen angels and, and, and a deception, all these things we, you know, these primordial creatures that you hear about, satyrs and uh, centaurs, minotaurs, um, wolfmen, like all these crazy mythological creatures or giants, um, mermaids, um, chimeras, all these crazy Greek mythological characters or even, even like, because there's some mention of even like these lion, the lion man in Moab that, that uh, they played with all this genetic stuff and uh, that's why the flood came, you know, so I'm moving ahead a little bit quicker and just than, than necessarily than what I've brought the information out. But all this stuff is coming together and that's why the prophetic word says that, uh, you know, the end of days will be like the days of Noah and, and we couldn't even begin to understand what the days of Noah were like unless we actually had access to the book of Enoch. And the book of Enoch actually is... It, right in the first couple of sentences it tells you it's written for the last generation and he tells you the meaning of the story about angelic incursion and interfering with human history and how they have their own progeny and, and this is where the heroes of old come from the demigods and the greek pantheon or roman pantheon or other cultures pantheon but they're all lesser deities you know than, than the great i am the uh, yahweh the most high elohim and this is what we need to understand and so this is where uh, the story is going to go when we explain some of this background. So that's why the, you know, the Hebrews understood and in a lot of ancient cultures to a degree understood how this affected the culture and how the nations were divided up under 70 Elohim and being ruled over. But Israel was separated from that group, uh, not Goyim, but are, are the nations, but to be God's particular special people that he was working through to... Um, develop a priesthood people and so i'll pick up the story from there and i'll go through the word curse because that word curse is very important to understand what and how israel stories is dealt with when they deal with all the uh tribes that were in their land where they're told to kill them and that word curse is connected to that and it's also connected to the recreation at the end and excuse me in chapter revelation 22 when the curse is done away with that this curse is actually uh, not necessarily just on us, but on these fallen angels, and they're the source of it, and that the curse is to destroy them. And, you know, at one point we were under the curse of the law, being sinners, but we've been set free from that curse, so we don't have to be destroyed, where there's no remedy for them being delivered from this curse. And so this is what we're being set up for, that uh, they're all going to be destroyed and thrown like a fire. But to get to that point, there's going to be hell on earth, and uh, this is what we all need to be aware of and be ready for when it comes. Like, I'm not the only one talking about this stuff is starting to come out and you know depending on how people are going to respond to it you know <laughs> it's going to determine how your life is going to go but it's not going to be a lot of fun if you're slow to believe you're going to have a hard time but anyways i'll leave it at a stop here and then i'll pick it pick it up here uh explaining some more stuff about some of the techno definitions of those words in genesis 3.